What is it, do you think, said Julia. I don't think it's anything, I mean, I don't think it was ever put to any use. That's what I like about it. It's a little chunk of history that they've forgotten to alter. It's a message from a hundred years ago, if one knew how to read it. And that picture over there, she nodded at the engraving on the opposite wall, would that be a hundred years old? More. Two hundred, I dare say. One can't tell. It's impossible to discover the age of anything nowadays. She went over to look at it. Here's where that brute stuck his nose out, she said, kicking the wainscoting immediately below the picture. What is this place? I've seen it before somewhere. It's a church, or at least it used to be. St. Clement Danes its name was. The fragment of rhyme that Mr. Charrington had taught him came back into his head, and he added half nostalgically. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. To his astonishment she capped the line. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's, when will you pay me? Say the bells of Old Bailey. I can't remember how it goes on after that. But anyway I remember it ends up, here comes a candle to light you to bed, here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It was like the two halves of a countersign. But there must be another line after, the bells of Old Bailey. Perhaps it could be dug out of Mr. Charrington's memory, if he were suitably prompted. Who taught you that, he said. My grandfather. He used to say it to me when I was a little girl. He was vaporized when I was eight, at any rate, he disappeared. I wonder what a lemon was, she added inconsequently. I've seen oranges. They're a kind of round yellow fruit, with a thick skin. I can remember lemons, said Winston. They were quite common in the fifties. They were so sour that it set your teeth on edge even to smell them. I bet that picture's got bugs behind it, said Julia. I'll take it down and give it a good clean some day. I suppose it's almost time we were leaving. I must start washing this paint off. What a bore. I'll get the lipstick off your face afterwards. Winston did not get up for a few minutes more. The room was darkening. He turned over towards the light and lay gazing into the glass paperweight. The inexhaustibly interesting thing was not the fragment of coral but the interior of the glass itself. There was such a depth of it, and yet it was almost as transparent as air. It was as though the surface of the glass had been the arch of the sky, enclosing a tiny world with its atmosphere complete. He had the feeling that he could get inside it, and that in fact he was inside it, along with the mahogany bed and the gate-leg table, and the clock and the steel engraving and the paperweight itself. The paperweight was the room he was in, and the coral was Julia's life and his own, fixed in a sort of eternity at the heart of the crystal. Chapter 4 Syme had vanished. A morning came, and he was missing from work, a few thoughtless people commented on his absence. On the next day nobody mentioned him. On the third day Winston went into the vestibule of the records department to look at the notice board. One of the notices carried a printed list of the members of the chess committee, of whom Syme had been one. It looked almost exactly as it had looked before, nothing had been crossed out, but it was one name shorter. It was enough. Syme had ceased to exist, he had never existed. The weather was baking hot. In the labyrinthine ministry the windowless, air-conditioned rooms kept their normal temperature, but outside the pavement scorched one's feet and the stench of the tubes at the rush hours was a horror. The preparations for hate week were in full swing, and the staffs of all the ministries were working overtime. Processions, meetings, military parades, lectures, waxworks, displays, film shows, telescreen programs all had to be organized. Stands had to be erected, effigies built, slogans coined, songs written, rumors circulated, photographs faked. Julia's unit in the fiction department had been taken off the production of novels and was rushing out a series of atrocity pamphlets. Winston, in addition to his regular work, spent long periods every day in going through back files of The Times and altering and embellishing news items which were to be quoted in speeches. Late at night, when crowds of rowdy proles roamed the streets, the town had a curiously febrile air. The rocket bombs crashed oftener than ever, and sometimes in the far distance there were enormous explosions which no one could explain and about which there were wild rumors. The new tune which was to be the theme song of Hate Week, the Hate Song, it was called, had already been composed and was being endlessly plugged on the telescreens. It had a savage, barking rhythm which could not exactly be called music, but resembled the beating of a drum. Roared out by hundreds of voices to the tramp of marching feet, it was terrifying. The proles had taken a fancy to it, and in the midnight streets it competed with the still popular, it was only a hopeless fancy. 
The parson's children played it at all hours of the night and day, unbearably, on a comb and a piece of toilet paper. Winston's evenings were fuller than ever. Squads of volunteers, organized by parsons, were preparing the street for hate week, stitching banners, painting posters, erecting flagstaffs on the roofs, and perilously slinging wires across the street for the reception of streamers. Parsons boasted that Victory Mansions alone would display 400 meters of bunting, he was in his native element and as happy as a lark. The heat and the manual work had even given him a pretext for reverting to shorts and an open shirt in the evenings. He was everywhere at once, pushing, pulling, soaring, hammering, improvising, jollying everyone along with cumridly exhortations, and giving out from every fold of his body what seemed an inexhaustible supply of acrid-smelling sweat. A new poster had suddenly appeared all over London. It had no caption, and represented simply the monstrous figure of a Eurasian soldier, three or four meters high, striding forward with expressionless Mongolian face and enormous boots, a submachine gun pointed from his hip. From whatever angle you looked at the poster, the muzzle of the gun, magnified by the foreshortening, seemed to be pointed straight at you. The thing had been plastered on every blank space on every wall, even outnumbering the portraits of Big Brother. The proles, normally apathetic about the war, were being lashed into one of their periodical frenzies of patriotism. As though to harmonize with the general mood, the rocket bombs had been killing larger numbers of people than usual. One fell on a crowded film theater in Stepney, burying several hundred victims among the ruins. The whole population of the neighborhood turned out for a long, trailing funeral which went on for hours and was in effect an indignation meeting. Another bomb fell on a piece of waste ground which was used as a playground and several dozen children were blown to pieces. There were further angry demonstrations, Goldstein was burned in effigy. Hundreds of copies of the poster of the Eurasian soldier were torn down and added to the flames, and a number of shops were looted in the turmoil. Then a rumor flew round that spies were directing the rocket bombs by means of wireless waves, and an old couple who were suspected of being of foreign extraction had their house set on fire and perished of suffocation. In the room over Mr. Charrington's shop, when they could get there, Julia and Winston lay side by side on a stripped bed under the open window, naked for the sake of coolness. The rat had never come back, but the bugs had multiplied hideously in the heat. It did not seem to matter. Dirty or clean, the room was paradise. As soon as they arrived they would sprinkle everything with pepper bought on the black market, tear off their clothes, and make love with sweating bodies, then fall asleep and wake to find that the bugs had rallied and were massing for the counterattack. Four, five, six, seven times they met during the month of June. Winston had dropped his habit of drinking gin at all hours. He seemed to have lost the need for it. He had grown fatter, his varicose ulcer had subsided, leaving only a brown stain on the skin above his ankle. His fits of coughing in the early morning had stopped. The process of life had ceased to be intolerable. He had no longer any impulse to make faces at the telescreen or shout curses at the top of his voice. Now that they had a secure hiding place, almost a home, it did not even seem a hardship that they could only meet infrequently and for a couple of hours at a time. What mattered was that the room over the junk shop should exist. To know that it was there, inviolate, was almost the same as being in it. The room was a world, a pocket of the past where extinct animals could walk. Mr. Charrington, thought Winston, was another extinct animal. He usually stopped to talk with Mr. Charrington for a few minutes on his way upstairs. The old man seemed seldom or never to go out of doors. 